this allow recording from now, but I see that you have started it, which is one, which is wonderful. So, okay. So thank you, thank you. Yeah, I think in in if it's uh, yeah, if it's not difficult to do, then I think I'm I'm perfectly happy for these sessions to be recorded, and uh, it's also for you the time to say hi to Manisha as well, who joined us. Um, a while ago and uh yes yeah, sorry Omkar, were you saying something yeah, no, what i was saying is uh, we usually live stream all the sessions on youtube so right. from next sessions onwards that's what we will do but okay. the, for, for for today the, the 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 channel on which we are supposed to live stream for this course was not up and ready and uh, oh. going with recording and later on we'll upload it on youtube but from next uh, session onwards it will be directly live streamed on youtube so the recording won't be required Okay. All right. That's, that's perfect. Yeah. That, that, I think that makes sense. Um, all right. So, uh, so Manisha, before you came, we were just exchanging uh, links to our LinkedIn profile. So if you have one, uh, then please drop it in the chat so we can connect beyond this call as well. This is mine. Hello. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, of course. So, um, so yeah, maybe at the risk of boring some of you, but in the interest of the recording, I will just, um, I think, quickly repeat what I said before we started recording, which is that this course can be roughly seen as being divided into two parts. The first half, the first six weeks is um, thematically very similar to topics that you have seen in PDSA. So we will be doing greedy for a couple of weeks. There'll be one week of DP, a couple of weeks of flows, and one week of NP completeness. So that's the uh, flow of themes in the first six weeks. And uh, the idea will be to, of course, recap them as you have seen them before, but also maybe a, maybe go a little bit deeper into, into uh, some of the ideas and spend a little more time doing more examples and so on. So, um, so we'll be taking advantage of the fact that you already have familiarity with these topics. So we'll probably often the explanations will not start uh, from the basics. So for example, when we are talking about DP, I'm assuming that you have seen recursion before and you've seen some DP implementations before. Uh, so a lot of it is about now the focus is on, okay, how, how to think about recurrences and how, how to think about them in a way that you can come up with your own. So often DP-based solutions, especially for the textbook problems, can feel at least a little bit magical because the problem is there. And then there is this recurrence that sometimes is, comes out of nowhere and, and might just blow your mind a little bit, if it's, especially if it's a slightly complicated problem. So we want to take the magic and the mystery out of the whole business. And uh, so there will be a lot of, um, in the lectures, I think, uh, there will be a lot of places where we try something and it doesn't work. So you should always watch out for that. So you'll probably start saying something. And especially if you're the kind who makes notes, you you may have to um, you you may have to be prepared for the fact that a lot of the stuff we say will not work out because we want to um, well, there's not maybe a lot of it, but definitely in some places we use that to emphasize uh, what does eventually work not looking magical so it's, so it's they become sort of stepping stones we say okay so why didn't that work it felt like it should be a very natural thing to do but it didn't work so let's go back to the drawing board and see what we were missing so it's sort of and then we improvise um at least in dp that happens a couple of times so um so yeah the idea is to kind of focus uh, a little also on you know the how can we come up with it ourselves aspect of things that's for one the other will be more examples and sometimes it'll just be new concepts that allow you to go a little bit deeper into the material so for greedy i think that that idea is the idea for metroid which we will see next week and uh, with flows also we'll probably go a little bit beyond the very first flow augmentation algorithm that you see i think we'll see ways of optimizing that further so that should be new as well um but some aspects of it really hopefully give you an opportunity to recap and um yeah it'll hopefully uh settle you in with the with the course and uh, in the second half of it hopefully will be more of coping with np completeness so by the time we get to the sixth week we have talked about np completeness and uh, we realize that not all problems have this nice situation that you can always solve 
any instance correctly in polynomial time. So any instance correctly in polynomial time are like three aspects of the kinds of algorithms we've seen so far, whether it is spanning trees or flows or shortest paths or, uh, you know, any of the other uh, non-graph algorithms uh, problems as well. But if you relax any one of these aspects, you get a whole new way of thinking about algorithms. So for instance, if you don't care for your answer to be correct, well, of course, you don't want your answer to be completely random, but you're okay with approximately correct answers, then that gives you the notion of approximation algorithms. Sometimes you're also happy if your algorithm works in some subset of inputs, as long as that's a reasonably cohesive subset of inputs. So for instance, maybe you're doing a graph problem and you say, well, okay, I don't care about this working out all the time. I only care for the problem to be solved on trees. And then you can leverage the structure that's afforded to you by trees. By focusing your attention just on trees, you can leverage the additional structure that they have and probably get a polynomial time algorithm, even though in general the problem is NP complete. So we already see one example of this happening when we are doing DP, uh, where we talk about the independent set problem on trees. So that's, that's one example of that, that sort of phenomenon at play. And sometimes you just want um, you know, you, you can't afford to approximate. You really want the solution to be, you know, obtained precisely. And the um, and, and you're really interested in solving it on all classes of graphs and or all classes of input. Then we look at what are called exact algorithms, exact exponential algorithms. So these algorithms are typically exponential. But within that, you could talk about, you know, what's uh, what's what's the best way and what's you can optimize within that. So for example, if you're solving something like longest path or Hamiltonian path, then if you just brute force, it's n factorial. And um, you could optimize again by using some DP based approaches. And there are also some other kinds of things that you could do to improve the n factorial to something like two to the n. So two to the n is also exponential. So I mean, when you compare it with polynomial time algorithms, of course, it's much worse. But compared to n factorial, it's much better. And given that we cannot hope for a polynomial time algorithm, we should be we should be optimizing as much as we can within the purview of things that are not um, about that. Yeah, within within the purview of problems that are in NP, but we believe are not in P, basically. So, um, so the, the second half after week six is basically going to be an exploration of each of these sort of paradigms. We'll look at the power of randomization, we'll talk about approximation, we'll talk about exact exponential algorithms, algorithms for special cases, and we'll also talk about heuristics, uh, which is just, you know, using, um, again, for greedy, we often say things like, okay, the intuitive thing is often wrong, so don't do it. But sometimes doing it still lands you with something that's at least usable compared to not having any algorithm at all. And then you can try to analyze how useful is that. Sometimes it leads you to proper approximation algorithms where you can actually analyze it and say that, okay, if it's a minimization problem and I'm looking for something that's, you know, at most whatever is the optimal solution, my algorithm will output something that's at most no more than twice. So I'm going to be off maximum by a factor of two. And that's very useful in many settings. But sometimes heuristics are just heuristics. So we don't have formal proofs around their performance one way or the other, but there's a lot of benchmarking and there's a lot of um, other things that you can do. And um, there are also lots of interesting tools like SAT solvers and ILPs that you can use to solve a lot of optimization problems in practice, even though they're theoretically like the textbook and pre-complete problems. So that's going to be sort of a brief overview of what's, what's kind of coming up in the first and the second halves of this course. And just to, um, just to be sure that um, we clear the weekly live sessions, I, I'll be around for, I, I, I believe at the moment, at least all of them, as long as you know there's no sudden conflict. And um, I look forward to using this time to exchange notes on the things that you have already seen. So I definitely recommend at least doing one of going through the notes or watching the videos. So might be um, might be too much to do both perhaps, but if you prefer watching, then 
go over the videos if you prefer to read, then most of the times we should have course notes or appropriate references for you every week. Most of the time it'll just be notes. So, so please do look at so, so the idea is that please do look at the material uh, in whatever format is convenient to you before coming on to the live call because that way we will have a chance to discuss what you have seen and clarify any doubts that you might have. And in fact, once you've looked at the material, just at least glancing through the problem sets would also be helpful for all of us, I think. So if there are any ambiguities, if there's anything that is not clear, or if you just have doubts or want to double check something, then you know we can do all of that. So the live session is a good place to exchange notes, get things clarified, share your feedback, go over some of the problems. I don't think we'll be able to discuss solutions, and certainly this is the first week, so we really don't have a past assignment to talk about. And to be honest, I don't remember exactly how the deadlines look, but eventually in the live sessions, we will be discussing solutions to previous assignments whose deadlines are, are gone, and so it's safe to discuss them. Um, but for an, a live assignment, we will be able to talk about clarifications. And um, you know, if something is not clear, we'll be happy to explain the questions further with examples and so on. However, we'll probably not want to get into spoilers, because that may be a little unfair to people who haven't had a chance to come to the recording and they don't remember to check it out. So yeah, probably not too many spoilers for live assignments, um, unless something just, you know, um, comes out through an example or a clarification, then it's a different thing. But that would be kind of the general policy. Um, but other than that, really a good place to discuss material. If you have, um, you know, if you have seen something or read something that's related to the material and you want to share it with everyone else, this would be a good place to do it. Or uh, like I said, if you have any feedback, now that, that would also be um, very welcome during these sessions. So yeah, I think that's all that I have to say in terms of introductory comments. But yeah, I'd like to um, hand it back to, I think, Omkar and Arup who are sort of, um, yeah, I think who, who, they, they will always be there for you in these sessions for sure. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, uh, they, they're also more, um, I think that they're, they're a lot more familiar with the problems than I am every week. So so it, it'll be, um, so typically they'll, they'll be, you know, walking through uh, the problem set in terms of either clarifying or in terms of uh, working through solutions of, of previous problem sets. Uh, but like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to be around and, and participate in these discussions. And I'm looking forward to it. So thanks again, everybody, for you know taking up uh, this course. And I think it's the first time we are offering it. So there may be a few loose ends here and there. So please bear with us as we sort of you know make this offering as nice as it can be. So your feedback will definitely play an important role. And um, yeah, I think, um, you know, it, it, it should be fun. And like I said, I'm looking forward. So yeah, back to you, um, Omkar and, and Arup. Yeah, thanks, ma'am. So maybe before uh, we speak anything, I think let students speak about what they feel about the course and maybe general feedback about uh, after watching first week of uh, content, uh, I, I I hope you all have gone through at least some part of it. So maybe some some uh, thoughts from uh, your side. Uh, right. Uh, so I went through the first week's videos and I actually loved it. Uh, I I think everything was very clear and I understood everything. Uh, I do have uh, I guess a general question to Professor Mishra. Uh, if you can answer it. So I have a background in maths and stats. Uh, CS is something I've not been much comfortable with, but I did take this course because I think it's essential. Um, so what, and I, I, I like to study by reading books. So I have the introduction to algorithm books with me as well. Uh, so I was wondering how would you recommend uh, for a student like me uh, to study and do well on this course? 
Okay, so welcome again to the course, Manon. Really thrilled that you are trying this out. And uh, math and stats background is actually very good and well suited to advanced algorithms because it's uh, it's a course which emphasizes proofs a lot. And in fact, the next week when we talk about matroids will really mostly be um, you know an excursion and like exploring a combinatorial object, and we'll try to you know, figure out how to define an appropriate object that captures the essence of what's happening in greedy algorithms. So uh, so you should feel right at home with that kind of material. And even in DP, I think a lot of the emphasis is on showing that these recurrences actually work as claimed and will be appealing to induction. So the whole flavor definitely uh, is very, you know, mathy, if that's a word, I guess. Um, so I, I think you should generally feel at home. And since you enjoy reading from books, I'm primarily following Jeff Erickson's uh, text on algorithms. Uh, it's uh, it's a fairly comprehensive book. So, so we, there's too much in there to cover fully in one semester, but we will be picking up um, as much as we can for the first six weeks. And after that also for approximation, um, and these are all links and pointers that, that we will make sure reach you either over an announcement or they're also available um, at, uh, on the course website in the references section. But we will be following um, a text called Parameterized Algorithms and one uh, called Approximation by Williamson and Schmoyes. And uh, the Parameterized Algorithms, I did not list the authors because there are several of them and um, I'm, I'm always afraid of missing a name or two, but you can definitely look it up um, on, on the course website. There's a pointer to the book and it's freely available. It's legally freely available, both of these books, which is uh, which makes it very convenient for us to recommend them as resources. And um, so between these books, Jeff Erickson's text on algorithms, the parameterized algorithms book and the book called The Design of Approximation Algorithms, we will be mostly covered in terms of what we are doing. The last week, we'll talk about these sort of heuristics and tools. And that'll be more of a, I don't know that I have necessarily a book recommendation for it, but, but we will be able to point to sort of multiple sources from where you can pick up several ideas. So it's it's really a lot about using actual solvers that are available off the shelf. And um, and that, that should really be a fun excursion into, you know, what's, what's possible in practice. Um, as of right now, I don't have a specific book recommendation on that one, but there should be a few surveys that I can point you to. But for the bulk of the course, these three books will have you completely covered, but they can be a bit overwhelming because they all cover a lot of material that's well beyond this course. So just make sure to watch out for like the pointers to the specific sections and subsections. Fortunately, most of those are self-contained and can be read without really having to read the book cover to cover. Um, so stick around with that and the, and the course notes, I'm going to do my best to make sure that we have course notes that are closely aligned with the material and the way it is covered in the videos. Um, also, I will say that there'll be a slight change of format in the videos from week one to the remaining weeks where um, in week one, I think I was trying to write it up in advance. And so you see these things that look like a voiceover over handwritten slides. But I just found it slightly inconvenient to be using the laser pointer thing to write out calculations. And I was, for me, cognitively, it was not easy to keep track of what I had already put on the slides and what I hadn't. So for the future videos, they, I mean, you might see that they're formatted slightly differently as well. And um, I'm just going to be writing in real time. And um, we've actually been recording some of these sessions together with, um, you know, Omkar and Arup um, also joining me for, for many of them. And so hopefully if there's something that looks, um, you know, obviously off, I've, I've already had some feedback to sort of correct, uh, to make corrections on the go. But, but yeah, I mean, I hope that you'll find the handwriting tolerable when I'm writing in real time. It can get a bit lopsided. So, so a little bit of a heads up for that. Uh, if it's if there's anything about the experience that's that's not nice, then you know, please reach out and let me know, and um, I'll see what I can do to improve it. But uh, but it's a more conversational thing, and it also forces me to slow down a little bit. I've been told at least for some of my other NPTEL courses, I've been told that I speak too fast. So so this way, by doing it in real time, it's, it's one way of forcing myself to 
uh, sort of not not run with the material. So that was a bit of a tangent. Coming back to your question, Varun, math, math and stats background is actually, I think, very appropriate for this course. But of course, I'm also assuming that it's not the first time that you're encountering algorithms or you know asymptotic notation and things like that, uh, because those things I'm kind of assuming are already in place from the PDSA course. So this is really designed for people who have finished one round of PDSA. And in, in, in case that's not the situation for you, I'd recommend either coming back to it after PDSA or just, you know, trying to catch up uh, with with some basic material and I can I can share pointers to the kinds of things that I'm explicitly assuming. Uh, right, thank you. Just uh, two follow-up questions to that. Uh, one, I, I have done PDSA before, uh, so that's out of the way. Um, so regarding the proof, uh, right, I'm comfortable with, I guess, epsilon delta definition, induction, and proof by counterexample. Is there any other method that we that we'll be using in the course that uh, I need to read upon beforehand? Right. Do you want to ask you a second question as well? Uh, I can answer them together if you want. Uh, so uh, uh, since I've I've done PDSA before, data structures was not something I was too comfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, so how much of that? What I need for this course. Right. Okay. So those are both fair questions. As far as proofs are concerned, at least as far as I can remember now, you don't really need anything more than um, induction. And uh, sometimes we will say some things like, you know, we're going to prove this by contradiction. Uh, but yeah, so, so basically, but most of it is really, so when it comes to things like DP and so on, most of it is, is really induction. Um, when we go through the recurrences and uh, sorry, when we go through reductions, then often we want to show that the reductions actually do what they claim that they will do. And those proofs are like, I, I don't, think there's a category of proof in discrete math that will necessarily prepare you better for it. Those are really proofs from first principles uh, where we are just trying to derive um, the truth of certain claims that we are making. And um, we'll, we'll try to sort of build, build it up slowly and intuitively. And a lot of the focus, at least in the way that I'm trying to do the videos, is to encourage uh, self-discovery. So because I think it's one thing to understand the mechanics of a proof that somebody presents to you, uh, it's usually, if you spend enough time, you'll eventually figure out that this works and you'll be convinced. But often it does leave you with a feeling of, you know, how how did somebody come up with that? And how can I come up with such things myself? And those questions are really tough to answer. And I'm, I'm not claiming that I'd be able to do it because uh, the, the, the answer to that is usually the way you come up with these things yourself is by seeing lots and lots of examples, doing lots and lots of exercises, and finally developing some kind of intuition that's very personal to you. And then eventually you'll find yourself being able to come up with arguments that you would not have been able to do before you put in all that time and practice and so on. But having said that, whenever possible, um, I think we do have these conversations where we'll go down blind alleys, we'll see that, okay, all right, we here's something that that should work but okay it didn't let's let's cross examine why it didn't and so on so you so in terms of style you'll have to be prepared for some of those journeys that we go through which is a little bit unlike reading a text where usually most textbooks will just tell you that okay um here is what we want to prove and here is how we're going to prove it and there isn't this whole discussion about let's try this and let's try that and let's get stuck and let's get unstuck so we will have an opportunity to do it in that style and at least some of the videos. So whenever it feels natural, I will do it. And um, in many cases, more than the proofs, and this is, I think, broadly true in math as well, often the definitions are more important than the proofs or the constructions are more important than the proofs. And the proofs kind of, once you have the right machinery set up in place, this the proofs kind of flow uh, because you have you have done all the legwork already for them to flow. So how do you anticipate what you're going to need in a proof and how do you set up your machinery accordingly? This will be especially true when we are doing reductions. So we will have two weeks of fairly intensive discussion around reductions. One will be when we are doing flows and the other will be when we are doing NP hardness. And um, in reductions, the heart of it is really this concept of a construction. We want to come up with you want to come up with a reduction and then prove that it is in fact a valid reduction. So there's a lot of nice back and forth between you know, the proof of the fact that the reduction works and the construction of 
how the reduction was designed. So when you're designing the reduction at the back of your mind, you'd know that, oh, okay, I want this thing to have these properties. This is what I will need to prove later. So I better do this now or it'll come back to bite me. So, so there's that kind of a mindset when you're developing the definitions or the constructions. And there will be a lot of emphasis on that. And there'll be a lot of emphasis on trying to approach things in a way that leaves you with some sense of um, confidence rather than um, amazed. I mean, okay, I mean, I think we all to some extent are going to be uh, blown away by the things that we see. This is a beautiful subject and people have done amazing things. So of course, there will be, at least for me, there's always a sense of awe and wonder when I'm going through a lot of these materials. But the idea is to also make it feel a little bit accessible and closer home. So, so to walk away with that sense of amazement, but also feeling that, okay, the things that I can, I can also think of a little bit myself if I, if I put my mind to it. So, so we also want to develop the confidence muscle a little bit as we go along. Um, and, um, uh, Okay, by now I think I've forgotten what your second question was. Sorry. So you said you've done, uh, you've done PDS and data structures is probably uh, not not your comfort zone. Um, so we will be basically using data structures implicitly very much. So for example, for DP, I'm going to say things like, okay, we will be storing things in a table, and I'm not really going to tell you that the table is a, is usually implemented as a 2D array underneath. And uh, similarly for graphs, we're usually going to be assuming that the graph has an adjacency list representation that we will be working with by default. And although I think Beach Beach May I keep encouraging um, people who are watching the videos to go out there and implement these algorithms uh, because that gives you, um, again, that, that gives you a different kind of understanding of what's going on when you, when you actually implement these algorithms. And... Um, I think it's very useful to do, but it's definitely not mandatory. And if you want to, um, you know, if you want to focus on, and if it's if it's overwhelming, it's it's completely okay to skip it in this first round. But yes, if you are actually going to go and implement some of these algorithms, then the data structures do become relevant to the point of at least being able to invoke them, knowing which ones to use, knowing how to use them, even if you don't know why they necessarily work as promised. So you need that much familiarity if you're, if you're going to implementation. And even when you are doing the running time analysis with me, I mean, for example, when we do Dijkstra running time analysis, we say that, okay, every invocation of find min or extract min is, you know, going to take us only log n time. And the reason for that is because we're using a heap without a heap, it would have been linear time. So those kinds of statements, you may have to just be a little bit extra careful to watch out for, you know, where in the analysis are we leveraging the fact that we're using certain data structures? Now, how those data structures are designed, why do they work? Why do they live up to their promises? That, if you want, you can just assume that it's a black box and it's okay. So for now, just awareness of what the data structures are and what they do, what they bring to the table, that is good enough. You don't really need to know the internals. That's not going to be so relevant at the moment. Yeah, okay. So I think hopefully that, that addressed your questions to some extent, but let me know if you have any follow-up comments. No, that's it. Thank you. Okay, perfect. All right. All right, Arya. I think you've raised a hand, and you, do you want to go next? Uh, I think I noticed something. That uh, with regards to the slides that they have uh, that has been shared with us, so I think there is a small disparity, uh, which is like I think some of the pseudo code that you've written is not present uh, in what we have been shared, and also like uh, in the matching pairs. Uh, so I think the ordering has been changed a bit, and that leads to like a circular this thing like uh, C is greater than A, and then A is greater than C. Uh, this thing. This kind of a, this, I mean, preference. So if that can okay. be corrected okay. a bit, so that yeah. would be really yeah. Uh, so, okay, yeah, thanks. Thanks for pointing that out. In fact, uh, now that you mention it, I realized that I think when I had 
when I'd made the slides, I think I'd shipped it off at that time uh, for for being shared in the repository. But I think when I was actually recording with it, I realized that there was indeed a typo with the. Um, yeah, I mean, I do want circular behavior from the algorithm, but I want the preferences to, to be valid preference. I don't I don't want the preferences to be circular. Yeah, I, so I think. The, yeah. So, so in the lecture, I think when I was recording, I realized that what's on the slides was actually uh, oh, it was not right. So I think I, I corrected it on the fly. Um, and um, I think I forgot to share the updated slide. So that's probably why the discrepancy is coming in. So I will I made a note to fix that. So I'll definitely share the updated slides um, going forward. I, I don't know if the, yes, yeah, so I think in the in the lecture notes for this, I probably don't do all the song and dance about the first greedy approach not working. I think we get straight into the correct one. So maybe that's something that doesn't even show up in the notes. Um, but I don't know if you if you have access to the to the notes link. I can drop it mm -hmm. here. Ma'am, we have. Like I did go through them, so I think it's Okay, yeah. So it's it's the sort of materials pages, web pages, and uh, yeah. So I think that's. So this uh, is the one. That I, so yeah, so okay. I think this is the one that I was mentioning where I didn't um, I didn't actually go through that particular example that starts on the slide. So this is also a good reminder for me to include that into your course. But yeah, I mean, hopefully, um, yeah, hopefully I'll I'll you should be able to see the updated set of slides soon. Yeah. Yeah, uh, ma'am. So, and uh, with regards to the notes, like uh, there is this, uh, uh, there's this uh, phrase that is used: uh, weekly Pareto optimal. So, uh, can we go into a little bit uh, into that and what it exactly means and why it's like uh, weekly? Because I didn't get it from the statement itself. So, okay, right. So let me just. Uh... Pull this up to make sure that we are on the same page. Um, OK, right. So Pareto optimality is sort of a general concept uh, that's sort of comes from. And I mean, I think it's it's more of an economics term than an algorithmist's term. But basically, um, so, so in this case, we're talking about matching. So matching is Pareto optimal if you know, there is no matching, which so so normal Pareto optimality is the following. Um, or let's talk about Pareto dominance first, because then it makes it easier to talk about Pareto optimality. So suppose you have two matchings, M1 and M2. Then M2 is said to Pareto dominate M1 if there is somebody who is strictly better off, okay, and nobody is strictly worse off. So if I said that, okay, initially I matched all of you according to M1, and then tomorrow morning I come and say, okay, forget about M1, we are going to be moving to M2, it's a brand new matching. Then you ask all the individuals, are you okay with this move? And everyone's going to say that they don't mind because they are they're not getting a partner who is worse. And in fact, at least one of them is not only going to say that they don't mind, they are actually going to say that they're very happy because they're going, going to get somebody who is strictly better. So, so at least one person is strictly better off and nobody is worse off, then, then M2 is set to Pareto dominate M1. So the idea is that if you moved from M2, M1 to M2, then nobody would really complain and at least somebody would be happy. So there is an incentive for us to shift from, from M1 to M2. And uh, that's Pareto dominance. And a matching that is not Pareto dominated by any other matching, that would be called Pareto optimal because you don't have um, you don't have a matching where you know. Um, okay, so so you you not. I mean, for every other matching, if you try to shift to that matching, what's going to happen is that either everybody is ambivalent, but okay, it's a different matching and these rankings are strict. So for somebody, at least if the matchings are different, somebody is going to experience a difference and somebody is going to complain. That's the idea. But okay, where is the weak coming from? Uh, the, the weak objective is to distinguish between the idea that, um, so with normal Pareto dominance, I said that at least one person is strictly better off and nobody is worse off. But you could be more demanding in your concept of dominance. You could say that I want Pareto dominance to guarantee that everybody gets a better partner. right? And when you say that um, 
you're not strongly Pareto dominated, right? Then you're weakly Pareto optimal because uh, because now to dominate, I have to work harder to find a matching that dominates you. So there may be matchings where, you know, like three people say that they have a better partner, but the remaining five people will say, you know, I don't care because, you know, I don't, I'm not, I'm not getting somebody who is better off. So of course, if you are, if you are Pareto optimal without the weekly, then you're not dominated by anybody in the, you know, in the previous weak sense of dominance. So of course, you're also not strongly dominated because, you know, you're not even dominated according to a more chindi definition of dominance. So you, if you're, so, so you so weekly, I mean, a Pareto optimal matching is also weekly Pareto optimal, but a weekly Pareto optimal matching may, may be dominated by, by somebody, some matching where somebody is strictly better off and everyone else is ambivalent. But, um, uh, but, but to say that you're weakly optimal, what it means is that there's no matching where everybody is strictly happier. That's kind of what we are trying to say. So, um, so if, you know, let's say that changing the matching is a lot of work. Okay. And most people would are lazy and they don't want to do all that work. So the only way you can shift to a new matching is if everyone is convinced that it is worth the trouble. So that is, that is this notion of stronger Pareto dominance. So I hope the difference between those two ideas is clear. Uh, uh, so it, as in like, I didn't, establish it properly so if, if you could please like repeat it once okay sure sorry so i think i lost your audio in the first like first few seconds when you were actually asking your question so uh, uh, yeah oh, i mean i was just asking that i did understand most of it like but uh the only part where I probably dropped off a bit was where you made the jump from the uh like the dominance to the optimality uh okay so right. yeah so I'm not sure if I'm able to share my screen here. Let me see if um, let me see if that's possible. And if yes, then I will try to. Okay, so it appears that Google Meet lets me share. Uh, I mean, okay, it doesn't let me directly share my iPad screen here, unlike Zoom. Okay, so let me okay let me say it verbally once again, and if it's not clear, then I'll see if I can make this whiteboard thing work on my iPad. But okay, from how do you go from uh, dominance to optimality? So if a matching can be Pareto dominated, whether weakly or strongly. So let's say um, you know dominated in the normal sense that is. If I am the matching M1 and you are proposing the matching M2 and M2 dominates M1 in the sense that at least one person finds M2 to be a better option for themselves and nobody is complaining about M2. They're like, ha, take care, matlab. It's, it's at least as good as M1, so I don't mind. So if that's the situation, then M1 in some sense is not a great choice because you can move to M2 while being strictly better for somebody. And without paying any penalty for making it better for somebody. There are no costs involved. Nobody is going to complain, right? So if you have a penalty-free way of moving to a matching that is making things better for at least one agent, then the current matching can be thought of as a suboptimal matching because if you if you were, opt I mean, an optimal matching is a great matching. And, you know, it's, it's the idea is that it's it's a matching that nobody would want to, you know, nobody would want to change anything. So if you're Pareto dominated by another matching, then that's not true. So um, so the op so what are the optimal matchings? The optimal matchings are the ones which are not dominated by anybody, because the moment you're dominated by someone, then that's the idea is that there is something better out there. So if there is something better out there, then, then that contradicts the idea that you're optimal. So that's where the terminology is coming from. So dominance means M2 dominates M1. Loosely speaking means that M2 is a better choice than M1. Specifically, it's a, it's a strictly better choice for at least one agent, and it's not a worse choice for anybody at all. So you have a penalty-free movement from M1 to M2. And... Um, so that's the notion of dominance. So matching which claims to be optimal ideally should not be dominated by anybody because the moment you're dominated, that means that there is a better option and that's why you're not optimal. So that's the general idea about relating dominance to optimality. Now the difference between weak and strong dominance or weakly and strongly optimal is simply the, the, 
the amount of support you need to define dominance. So the way I define dominance right now is that, you know, it's a it's an easygoing notion of dominance. As long as you make one person strictly happier without upsetting anyone, you're already dominating. A more demanding notion of dominance would be that okay, everyone has to has to say that they're better off. Then you say that you are strongly dominating. You could also define some intermediate concept of dominance, saying 50% dominance, which is that M2 dominates M1 if half the agents say, at least half the agents say that they're better off in M2 compared to M1. So you could have this whole spectrum of dominance definitions. For each of them, you will have a corresponding notion of optimality definitions. So the more you demand from uh, dominance, the easier it is for me to claim to be an optimal matching. Because to contradict or to counter my optimality, you have to work harder to find a matching that dominates me. right? If the, if the notion of dominance is more demanding, if I'm saying that oh, everybody has to vote in favor of the new matching, that means it's harder work to find a matching like that so the optimality concept gets a uh, sort of a easy pass if the optimality concept is defined around strong dominance so that's why strong dominance leads to weak optimality because now a lot of matchings that are not so great can chill because they're not dominated in the stronger sense even though they may be dominated in a weaker sense so that's why i know a lot of this terminology can be a bit confusing but hopefully the intuition for why strong dominance would be associated with weak optimality is clear but let me know if not. I'm happy to try to, you know, draw out a few examples or something. So, I mean, I got all, to be honest, so it's fine. Like, okay. All right. Good. I mean, I think it's, it's also a nice uh, reminder for me to maybe expand out on those definitions a little bit in the notes. So I'll do that and I'll let you guys know. Hopefully by next week, the notes will be cleaned up with respect to these two pieces of feedback. One is on the slides. And the other is about elaborating on these definitions a little bit. Yeah. So, so, so I'll be sure to do that. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, apart from that, like, uh, like we, we had this, uh, we have this practice assignment, right? So uh, for, mm -hmm. from that there, I was trying to prove, uh, like there was this greedy question. So I was trying to prove uh, the algorithm. So, I mean, I was thinking maybe I could uh, discuss it with you if anyone, after everyone else has like asked their questions because it might take some time. So, okay, sure. Sounds good. I mean, I think, uh, like I said, um, yeah, so discussing assignment problems is just a little bit tricky uh, only because of the fact that I think these are these are currently assignments whose deadlines are in the future, I think. Ma'am, this uh, is like a practice assignment, so it will not be uh, like counted in the total score. So this is like just for practice. So I mean, uh, so Arup sir and like Omkar sir can like let you know about it. So Okay, so I just wanted to confirm if so. I think I... Um, yeah, so, so I think we have worked out two sets of practice assignments. I don't know if, uh, okay, so there's one that is really just food for thought, but there is one which might contribute to the evaluation. So, you know, you can bring up the question and if it's one that's truly, you know, not going to be evaluated or not going to contribute to the final score, then, then of course, you, then, you know, we're very welcome to discuss it right away. But if not, then then maybe it may be a good idea to hold it out for another week until the deadlines are gone. So, so we can figure that out when we when we get to that, um, which should probably be in a few minutes. Uh, but yeah, if the others have any comments or questions, um, then, you know, that that would be welcome right now. Yeah, good evening, ma'am. Hi. Yes, ma'am. So I went through the lectures. Uh, it was pretty consistent in difficulty, like from starting to from starting from storage files to stable matchings and the intuitions of like how we approach uh, different algorithms and canceling out intuitions so we get to the correct one that was pretty good and and you said uh, like before that in the upcoming weeks so we'll be uh, learning about heuristic algorithms so are the similar uh, those uh, like similar to like how how we solve for problems like DSP and those like H star algorithm simulated and annealing like those. Right. Um, yeah. So DSP is like I think a holy grail of like a problem that comes up a lot when we talk about heuristics because people have 
thrown so many different things at DSP, um, starting from evolutionary genetic algorithms to, yeah, I mean, other things that are involved nature inspired computing and things like that. Um, so for now, at least the planned syllabus, and I think we may um, uh, we may feed in a few more things um, along the lines that you have just mentioned. But for now, the focus is mostly on SAT solvers and ILP solvers, which are the reason I want to focus on these is because you can um, uh, that the state of the art solvers are really very good. And um, you can just install them literally as like in the case of ILP solvers, I think Gurobi is like literally a Python package, which is very well documented and very easy to follow up on. And so most of our focus will be on taking these optimization problems, many of which we would have already seen up to that point in the course, and seeing how to rewrite them in the language of SAT, constraint satisfaction, or integer linear programming. So a lot of the focus will be on, you know, how to how to re-describe or redefine your algorithm in a way that makes it solver friendly. And then you can outsource the task to the solvers and you know that would work basically. So that's the yeah, that's that's the current plan. But you're right, I mean that there are a lot of other like the world of heuristics is I mean, you know, you could do an entire course in heuristics and it, it would still not be enough, probably. So I, I want to choose a section of it to give you a glimpse into. And I wanted it to be somewhat um, um, to, for the transition from the rest of the course to also feel smooth, because sometimes heuristics can be like a whole different world. But I think we would have seen SAT, you would have seen ILP by the time you get to the last week. And I just want to double down on those concepts and see how they can be really, really useful. So currently the plan is SAT, CSP, and ILP in terms of heuristics. And like a few other, I think a few other anecdotes I want to tell you about. There is a concept called kernelization, which apparently uh, this is, so that's thought of as a formal framework that can analyze heuristics. And there's a really lovely story about like the European rail network actually using kernelization as a concept to solve, um, a real network scheduling related problem. So I want to tell you a few stories like that just to show you how real world um, applications of algorithms is usually not like, you know, it's not that you map it to a textbook chapter and directly apply an algorithm necessarily, but it can just involve like clever combinations of techniques. So yeah, so all right. So I guess that's... Um, yeah, so, so that's that's the plan for week 12 at the moment. But uh, but if there's something specific that you want to see, then then feel free to drop it in as a suggestion. And I'm happy to, if it's something that can be made to fit in terms of feasibility, I'm, I'm happy to try and work it out. Yeah. Yeah. All right, sounds good. All right, Manisha, I think um, you were probably not around when introductions were happening. Actually, I was also not around when the intros were happening. I also joined um, a few minutes after the call started. So do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and, um, you know, why you found this course to be of interest? Yeah, so um, hi, I'm Manisha. I have uh, 14 years of experience. Uh, I'm a C++ developer for 14 years. Uh, that's my... <laughs> background uh, i did my b uh, before that and i wanted to do this uh, course for data science because now it is the new uh, upcoming technology and about advanced algorithms uh, yeah i since being in this uh, for a long time i've always liked working on algorithms and pdsa was my favorite course so this was part two of PDC kind of. So yeah, that's why I took advanced algorithms. Although I do struggle with quite a lot of con concepts on it, but I still like doing it. So yeah. Okay, that makes two of us, I think. <laughs> so that's amazing. All right, now that's great. I think um, I, I, I would love to uh, see you at the live sessions if you can make it to them and maybe you can give us some tips on, you know, uh, implementation aspects considering you've spent so much time with C++ and uh, that's a sort of a favorite uh, implementation language for, for many, I think C++, the STL at least has a, really nice algorithms library 
And so, uh, so although unfortunately programming assignments are not an official part of this course or the assessments, it is something that I'm, I do constantly recommend as a thing to try out. Uh, so if people are doing it of their own interest, and maybe if they have doubts that I won't be able to address, it'll be great if you can be around and <laughs> help us out. It'll be, um, I mean, my implementation, uh, I mean, it's something that I love to do, but but it's something that I also often struggle with the details of. So it would be, um, I mean, no pressure, of course, but it would be lovely to have your sort of support and yeah. Yeah, sure. I was in fact, um, while you were discussing about the uh, implementation part and uh, you were suggesting us to, you know, try things out. I was thinking that I would uh, do it in both this time. So PDSA was Python, and I honestly I was not so well versed with Python back then. So I struggled a lot with PDSA Python implementations. But now, since we have no uh, language barrier here, so right. probably I'll do it in C plus plus because it's easier. Okay, right, I share it with people also. Okay, no, that's fantastic. Yeah, I think I will, I will follow up on those suggestions by actually maybe sharing pointers to like concrete places that that you can, you know, uh, source relevant problems and and get some practice in for anyone who is interested in doing that. And uh, yeah, really glad to have you on board. And um, yeah, I'm sure this will be um, a special twelve weeks together. So looking forward to it. And um, yeah, all right. So so if there are um, yeah, I mean, any any further comments are welcome. I don't know if Omkar and Arup wanted to say something. And uh, sorry for sort of taking up some of your time, and um, uh, especially at the start. But please feel free to add anything that that I missed when I was talking about how we want to format these sessions and so on. No, no, no. Nothing, nothing was from my side. Okay. Yeah, Umkar, yeah, please. No, no, I'm just asking, do you have anything else to add? Uh, no, no, no. Um, I have a request. So can yeah. we have this session hours uh, a bit later, like after 7 o'clock or something? Um, I, so the thing is, I'm not familiar with the logistical constraints that the team uh, may have. I just noticed Varun's message in the chat. And I think, um, I, I don't know if he intends to uh, come back regularly, but it looks like he does have a 7 p.m. constraint. What we could do if it's feasible, and uh, maybe Omkar or Arup can uh, take this up, is to, because I think this is a relatively smaller class, so maybe we can do a poll among, um, you know, among all of us who are in this together and uh, just find out everybody's availability, especially those uh, those who plan to make it to the live classes. And then maybe we can find a schedule that that works well for everyone, hopefully. Yeah, sure, thanks. Another suggestion is that uh, some other courses have WhatsApp groups, uh, including oh. the instructors and everyone. So, uh, you know, deciding the timings and all happens on the groups. OK, yeah, easy. that would certainly make it easier. I think my understanding was that there is a discourse forum, but I unfortunately have not been able to find a way of getting in there. So um, so, yeah, maybe we can we can figure out either either activate the discourse discussion forum. But again, if it's a smaller group and WhatsApp is feasible and works for everyone, maybe we can just do a WhatsApp group as well. And I'm perfectly um, happy to do either, and um, I look forward to being active on whatever it is we decide is the modus of discussion. So, so I leave that to the sort of the experts to figure out. So, I think Omkar and Arup, maybe you can work with the ops team and figure out what's the best. Yeah, we'll do that. This oh, what's up, yeah, sure. All right, sounds great. Okay. This course, all of the students are added. I think only, I mean, you might be facing the issue because your domain is different. Yeah, so, so. yeah. I think my, um, yeah, my email address is on a different sort of enterprise platform. So maybe that's yeah, not that might be the reason. So anyway, uh, Arup is already followed up on that. So, okay, we'll nice. back on that. so that's already there. But if that doesn't work anyway, we'll, we'll move to WhatsApp. Sure. That sounds like a plan. Okay. So I think, um, okay. So, so if, um, 
I guess if there, there there aren't any other questions, we can circle back to, if I remember correctly, Arya wanted to discuss one of the practice problems, right? Uh, yeah, yes, ma'am. So uh, is it okay if I share my screen because it's a bit longer problem? So yeah, I mean, absolutely. Okay. Uh, so I'll just share my screen. Uh, Ma'am, so like this is the uh, practice assignment. So over here, like uh, there is this question on uh, n dragon heads and m knights. So, yes. Uh, so over here, uh, like uh, I haven't tried out proving per se this bipartite thing, but I mean it seems uh, very intuitively correct. But uh, I mean. Uh, do you think like this is a i mean is it a good idea to <laughs> try proving this bipartite uh, this thing and if you can give some tips on how to get started with the proving of this uh, that would also be very helpful so that is like a first question but i did try proving this c part so i'll discuss it with you uh, just to know, because like this is my first time doing some kind of formal proving um, in hmm. like this DSA kind of a setting. So if right. I'm doing it the right way, so I'll be really grateful if we can discuss the C part because I did it on my notebook. But the first part, I didn't have a very good idea of how to do it. So then this. Right. So for the other parts, by the way, I think um, the the other arguments. Did you did you find counter examples to rule them out? Or? Yeah, yeah. For B and D, I basically just found counter examples. Okay. So, All right. so, so then that's um, that's fair enough. Now let's see. Um, Again, the first one, the suggestion is to model the problem as a bipartite graph. So you have uh, on the one side, you have the knights on the other side, you have a dragon head. And um, the edges correspond to the feasibility. So I think um, if you have a diameter D dragon head, then the knight has to be at least as tall as D to be able to chop it off. And, um, and the cost involved is, okay, so Right, so, so the cost involved is H of K, so this is fine as well. Uh, that's reflected in the in the weights in the weights of these edges. Um, so we want to find a maximum matching of minimum cost. Um, the, uh, maximum matching would ensure that you're packing as many edges as possible, and. Um, I, one thing that I'm trying to remember or trying to figure out from the problem description is, um, okay, the reason the matching makes sense is because we have this constraint that a knight can only chop one dragon head. So you cannot ask a knight to chop more than one. So it makes sense that you're looking for a matching. And um, if you don't have a matching that accounts for all the dragon heads, then of course this is not feasible. So that that part of it is. So the, the fact that um, you know, if there is no matching of size n, we say that there is no feasible answer. That is reasonable because every solution will correspond to a matching of size n. And therefore, if the maximum matching itself falls short of n, then there is no valid solution. So that part is okay. But, yes, ma but like, uh, like my, my specific, uh, like I, I totally agree with this A statement. Like it makes sense properly. But if I have to prove something like this, uh, like, like huh. if I design an algorithm and then I have to prove its optimality and correctness. Right. So how do I proceed in that sense? Because it makes sense. But in like you said in the lecture, also like greedy makes sense a lot of times. But it's better right. to prove it. So right. something right. like that. Certainly. No, you would certainly want to actually, uh, I mean, although the format of the assignment is such that we cannot solicit the proofs from you, but it's certainly better to be sort of completely sure when it comes to something like this. So here, I mean, basically what you would want to do is to say that let's, let's look at what any solution looks like. And so suppose, for example, you report, um, you report the cost of the min cost maximum matching, right? And suppose that was not optimal, then, then what does that mean? It means that there is some other way of assigning these tasks, these chopping tasks to the knights in a way that does it better than the maximum matching of minimum cost. 
Now, first of all, this maximum matching. So this um, this bipartite graph has n vertices on one side, which is the number of dragon heads, right? And um, the, I mean, of course, m is at least n because otherwise the story is over before it starts. You don't have enough nights. So m is at least n. So any matching um, has, um, well, any, okay, so already the maximum matching being less than n we have discarded and the correctness of discarding those scenarios, I think that uh, that part is truly straightforward. So I will not go into that much further. But therefore, basically, if we have survived and we have the algorithm has not said no, it means that it's looking at a maximum matching, which must have n edges, right? Because if, if the maximum matching was fewer than n edges, then anyways, we would have said no. So the maximum matching that's output by the algorithm, it happens to have n ed edges. It actually accounts for everything on the dragon side. And so let's say you have output some cost. Let's call this cost C. And now you can try to prove this somewhat by contradiction by saying that, OK, suppose this is not the right answer. Then what can we say? It's not the right answer because there is some other answer whose cost is strictly less than C. OK, so let's look at that other answer. And let's look at in that answer, which knight is chopping which dragon head. You take that answer and you can associate with that answer a matching here, which has also n edges because that's a valid answer. So all dragon heads must must have been chopped. So that answer would have would have corresponded to a matching with n edges. And the cost of the matching here, which corresponds to that answer, is the cost of the cost reported by that answer. So that's a lower cost maximum matching compared to C, but that contradicts the idea that you're working with a maximum matching of minimum cost. Does that make sense? Uh, okay, ma'am. I mean, I did get most of it, but I'll I'll revisit it because I think uh, I mean, like we can uh, if if it's okay, like if I have some follow up doubts, like can we yeah, discuss yeah, this sure. the I next think, time? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Also, see if you can just try to write it out because it really helps. You can say yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The broad framework would be contradiction. The idea is that you want to say that any solution, like there is a exact correspondence between matchings in this graph and solutions that you can come up with. So once you are convinced that that correspondence is cleanly there, then the rest of the proof is is really mostly working through formalities. So, so that's kind of, uh, that's fine. Um, so this is by contradiction. Normally, when you're trying to argue in favor of a greedy algorithm, mm -hmm. you typically have what is called an exchange argument, which is that, or a greedy stays ahead kind of an argument. So you try to compare the greedy solution with some presumed optimal solution head to head. And then you try to see, okay, what's the first place where the greedy choice deviates from the so-called optimal choice? Once you have identified that place, you want to say you want to do some sort of a cut paste thing saying that, okay, instead of doing what opt did, what the optimal solution did, if I substituted with what the greedy algorithm was doing, I would still be okay. That is sort of uh, sometimes some people call it a cut paste argument. Um, so, so either you have an exchange argument where you try to take some piece of the greedy solution, some piece of the optimal solution and combine it in meaningful ways. Or there's this concept of greedy stays ahead, which is that you show that the greedy algorithm does at least as well as any other approach to the problem when you are comparing the solutions head to head. And um, you know that's that's also a um, a nice sort of a template for for a proof, basically. So um, so for part C, do you want to explain what your what your argument is for the correctness of that that algorithm? Yeah, yes, ma'am. So for part C, uh, I'll just highlight it because <laughs> it's, it's a bit difficult. So what I've done is like, uh, I used a mathematical induction. I don't know if it's the best way, but mm -hmm. what I said was that, uh, let's say, so if there was only one dragon and various knights available, so uh, we will uh, by default, if, so the co total cost would be of only that one knight, which will kill that one dragon. So then the uh, obvious argument would be that we will be choosing the minimum uh, height knight, which uh, so that it, I mean, the knight which has the least height amongst the ones which are feasible. So with, which uh, satisfy the, satisfies the D less than equal to H criteria. 
so and then i said that let us assume that uh, this goes on for the for k dragons and if there are like k plus one dragons then again it's just uh like so uh, so the cost can again be broken down as cost of k dragons and the cost of the k plus one at the dragon and uh, the k dragons cost is already minimized and for the k plus one at dragon basically we again choose the uh least height knight because uh, that would be the minimum addition to the total cost and therefore by uh, induction we can say that uh, this is correct uh, i mean does this make sense like yeah i think that's that's actually reasonable so what you're saying is well let's say that if we have um so you're trying to prove some statement about an instance with n heads and m knights and i think your base case is fine so we'll um, not dig deeper into that. But in general, what you're saying is for any smaller instance, which involves fewer dragon heads or fewer knights, um, let's assume that the greedy algorithm does the job correctly. Now I want to show that my current answer is optimal. Uh, what I'm doing right now is optimal. So we are saying, um, so we're saying that let's take the um, so so let's fix some dragon heads. So here I think we are not specific about which in which order we are processing the dragon heads. So I don't know if that's that's going to be an issue. But let's see. So for for every dragon head, I'm associating with it a set of knights who can sort of feasibly um, attack that dragon head, right? So um, so. Now what we are saying is okay, so you're going to you're going to make one match for some dragon head, you're going to match it to the cheapest knight in some sense, the shortest, the knight that's going to cost you the least amount of gold coins. You're going to associate it with that knight and you're going to sort of take this pair, set it aside. And for the rest of the instance, you're invoking the induction hypothesis to say that, well, the greedy thing would have given me the best um, outcome on the rest of it. So when I combine it, I'm, I'm going to be optimal overall. The only thing to be careful about is, um, for instance, um, yeah, so, so one thing to be careful about would be, have you knocked out, like, have you used up a knight who was um, perhaps, yeah, so, so when you go to appeal to the induction hypothesis, the induction hypothesis in the smaller instance may just report that it's not a feasible instance. So in this case, you will have to argue that even the original instance was not feasible. So those are like two scenarios yeah. that you want to explicitly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I actually got into that. So in order to tackle that, uh, I mean, this situation, uh, wherein a feasible situation may be, I mean, a, wherein a feasible solution may be left out, that might only occur when, uh, let's say, uh, basically, uh, a knight of height that is greater than the least required height is used to eliminate a particular dragon, right? Otherwise, this situation cannot occur until unless, like, of course, we've already mentioned that if we cannot do the pairing, then it's already not feasible. But if it is feasible and if we uh, allot a knight which has higher height than the least required height, then that might, knight could have been used in a for, for killing a larger dragon, but that was used for a smaller dragon. But by the design of the uh, algorithm, we are always choosing the shortest height. So this is not possible in the environment that we've created. And hence, uh, this should not be an issue. So. Right. So your point is that everyone who was, um, so suppose, for instance, that um, let's just do it by example. Suppose we have two dragons and two knights and one of the knights can kill both of them. But the other, so, so let's say we have dragons A and B and knights X and Y. And let's say X and Y can both kill A, but only X can kill, um, only X can kill Y. And our question would be something like, thanks, Manisha, see you next time. Cheers. So our question would be, can we, uh, like, do we get into a bad situation by using, for example, X to kill A, because X was the only knight that could have, that could have killed B, but we use X to kill A, and then we are stuck with Y and B. And Y cannot kill B, but maybe there was an optimal solution that said, let's use X to kill B and Y to kill A. But your point is that the situation will not arise because 
if y cannot kill b, it must be because y is shorter than x. Because if y was taller than x, then it could have killed everything that x is killing as well. So, so it wouldn't have been. It wouldn't have yeah, been. It, it would have been chosen by the algorithm. Right. So the yeah. algorithm would have instead chosen um, the shorter. So the fact that y is not a feasible option for the other dragon head means that that would be the knight that was chosen for the for the first dragon head. So the, I mean, okay, so my only, uh, I think my concern is not with the answer, but it's actually with the question. So the question is sort of deliberately ambiguous about the order in which the dragon heads are being processed. But I think the approach that you have for proving this as a, as a framework is fine. Um, I just say be careful about writing out the cases. And, you know, I'm certainly happy to sort of revisit this if you want to maybe put your sort of proof concept on a Google Doc and, you know, just share it. Like once we have a WhatsApp group or the forum is active, uh, you're welcome to share it there. And, and um, you know, I can, I can go over it and sort of maybe help out with identifying whether the description constitutes a complete proof or not. Yeah. Okay, okay, ma'am. Uh, but I, I mean, coming to the point that you were saying, like, uh, like the the order of processing of the dragons doesn't really matter, right? Like, because uh, why should it uh, really matter? I mean, I, I no, can't think sure. of a counter example. Which... No, sure. So in this particular algorithm, I, I also agree that it doesn't matter, which is why I think we decided to kind of leave it a little bit hanging. But sometimes I think um, sometimes you can find an example by saying that, oh, I mean, since an order has not been specified, the order is perhaps arbitrary, right? So sometimes it's important that you actually process things in an increasing or a decreasing order. In this case, I think you are right um, that, the, um, that the specific order in which we go about things should not matter because these are kind of local decisions we are going to pick. Well, I mean, the, the only thing I would be worried about is that um, uh, in terms of why the order matters is because you're picking the locally the best knight available for the job when you take the dragon head. And it's possible that by processing things in a particular order, you you may have knocked out a knight or you may have used up a knight who, who would have been useful um, for a different for a different dragon head. But I, I think so that makes your argument, I guess, have to do more work because now you want to say that no matter what order is chosen by the greedy algorithm, we will be we will be okay. So I think your point is that okay, if after a certain point of time we used up all the knights that were supposed to be feasible for a particular dragon and then we have to say no, then well, it was a no anyway because um because we just didn't have I mean, we we had a collection of some K plus one dragons and only K knights collectively who were who had the ability to kill these K plus one dragons. So that is what it is, I think, boiling down to your your proof idea. Uh, but it's sometimes just fixing an order makes it easier to write the proof also because then you know that the algorithm is forced to approach the knights or the dragons in this order and then you can take advantage of the order when you're writing the proof as well so yeah so, so in this case I, I would cautiously agree that i think you're right that the order doesn't matter in general the order can even if it doesn't matter sometimes it makes the job of writing the proof a little bit easier and in some cases i think the uh, the order does matter in the sense that if she, i mean like it depends a lot on the algorithm but in many algorithms it does happen that because of a particular choice of ordering our choices are going to like the algorithm is going to work out if we did not respect that ordering and just did it in some other way then perhaps the algorithm would not have worked out so that's the sort of um i think that's that's the point i was trying to make in this example i am i i would bet that i i think you you're right and your approach to the proof is also in in very much the right spirit um i would definitely since you are taking an interest in you know um articulating proofs i think that's that's a very healthy approach to this so um so i think it would be really nice if you can put down your thoughts in a google doc or something similar and share it with us and um you know one of us certainly will will get back to you i mean i'll, I'll do my best to get back to you as soon as i can uh, okay sure uh, and small thing that uh, i'm doing this proof also like i had another idea which was that I, I mean, uh, why do we, is it necessary to also talk about the uniqueness of the 
प्रोसीजर और आई मीन यूनिकनेस ऑफ दोल्यूशन और इज इट नॉट रिक्वायर्ड मोस्ट ऑफ द टाइम well i think again in this example actually i suppose for example if you have a situation where your dragon heads have diameters let's say 1 2 3 4 5 and you have let's say five knights all of whose heights are 10 or something then you actually have probably five factorial solutions because any knight can kill any dragon and the costs are going to be the same because all the knights have the same height so in this case the solutions in general are not unique and for the correctness of greedy algorithms we are generally happy as long as the greedy algorithm can identify one of the many possible optimal solutions so that's all that you care about that it can it can discover at least one of them um sometimes if the solution if the problem is structured in such a way that it happens to have unique solutions then often it's a little bit easier to reason about things um i think with one of the problems at least with dance classes uh i think you know there will be several instances of dance classes where the greedy solution is not the only one that you can come up with other solutions that have the same size but those would not be discovered by the greedy algorithm and they may be nicer to you in terms of you know the schedules being more convenient or something uh but since we have not added any other you know aspects to the model we only care about the maximum number of classes that you can fit in you'll notice that most of the statements there are along the lines of you know uh, there is a solution there is an optimal solution that respects the greedy structure we don't care about all of them we only care about being able to cling on to one so so in most optimization problems uniqueness will not be a guarantee and therefore you have the luxury to basically say that okay i'm not obliged to keep track of all optimal solutions as long as i'm able to discover one of them i'm i'm perfectly happy Uh, okay, okay, man. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I should probably stop sharing this screen because. Oh, that's perfectly fine. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. thanks. Um. Yeah. No. Thanks for bringing it up and and for working through the practice problems as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, ma'am. And this last uh, one, like general uh, query, which is that uh, whatever you cover in this course, like, uh, do you have a good uh, resource which I can refer to for, uh, for maybe doing some kind of parallel uh, implementation, maybe using OpenMP or MPI on any of the algorithms that you uh, offer in this course? Is it possible? Then? right so i don't have like a consolidated resource off the top of my head but um, but i think there are a few different sort of servers which do host i mean interesting uh, implementation challenges and of course one place where you can find lots of fun problems to think about is is um, competitive programming sites as well so both the olympiads as well as icpc as well as other regular uh, competitive programming platforms like code forces do have problems that um, at least are close to some of the topics that we cover in the first 5 weeks of the course after that i think the well i mean some contests do get into like np complete problems but that's relatively rare but there are other contests and other other sources of of uh, problems so for instance there is something called the pace challenge which i think maybe a little um uh, that, that maybe a little bit out of scope but it's an example of the kind of thing i'm talking about so just like the machine learning people have platforms like kaggle and so on where they're constantly being hit with uh, you know data science challenges uh, nlp challenges and so on so there are a few that are of this sort even for just more traditional algorithms so uh, let me collect a few pointers to such resources and uh, we'll try to get it across to you through an announcement or by adding it to the website one of these things yeah, yeah sure ma'am i mean uh, just clarifying like i wanted a more specific guidance on like uh, like there is the, there are these parallel processing frame, frameworks right like uh, open mp mpi so i mean uh, so wherein we can use multiple threads to uh, get an algorithm running right so uh, because uh, usually when we code uh, just for the algorithm it's like a single thread uh, process right so if you are uh, if the resources also include some kind of uh, you know uh, like motivation and also ideas for implementing stuff like that like for full fulkerson on maybe like a gpu with or maybe like using various threads to implement for fulkerson even if it's possible or not 
uh, or maybe dijkstra so that would also be very helpful so because i am a bit interested in those things like uh, high performance computing and stuff and how can we really get these things in, uh, implemented and deployed on such systems with without any kind of uh, you know these errors that happen because of uh, you know race conditions and all that stuff so uh it just like as a so side uh, interest of mine so okay no that's that's fantastic i think i probably missed when you talked about open mp specifically so here is uh, for now just a quick link to a really popular course on uh, programming parallel computers which you may have already seen but this course is really well designed and it has a lot of pointers and resources and class projects and things like that i think they just finished a run recently uh, it's it's um, it's run by a group of people at uh, Palo Alto University, I think. And uh, so just as a quick pointer or resource, you might want to just uh, dig a little bit deeper into this one if you have an interest in, um, in parallel computing frameworks. Unfortunately, I'm not very... Um, I'm not very well versed with a lot of the ways in which things can be made more efficient with parallelism. And I do know um, as a matter of general principle that that's, that's a really good thing to watch out for. But it's somehow just not an emphasis on the main track of the materials that we will be covering. But I think it's it's a it's a great point, and uh, it's a good thing for me to sort of follow up on a little bit, and maybe as we discuss and meet in the live sessions, if there is anything specific that I think would fall in this category, then I will I will give you specific like more specific pointers as we go along. Sure, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. All right. Sounds great. All right, so in terms of like the official duration of the live session, we still do have time. So, so you know, any more questions or suggestions or comments would still be uh, very welcome. Um, but if, um, if not, then, you know, I'm happy to also respect your time. And if you have other things to get back to, then we can also call it a wrap for now, but we will figure out a few things like correcting the slides. Um, adding a few more pointers to implementation -y things and uh, figuring out maybe a WhatsApp group for us or something similar. And, uh, and hopefully I will be all set for continuing our conversation next week, I suppose. Uh, I mean, I have some little queries, but I mean, I was thinking maybe it's too long, so I didn't want to raise them. But if you have the time, I can ask them. Yeah, I think we we definitely, I mean, even officially, I think we, um, you know, the session is slotted up to eight. So, yeah, I mean, uh, please be free. Uh, okay, ma'am, then I'll have to again share my screen because it's from the practices again. Like, uh, there is one okay. question which, uh, I mean, uh, I'm not very clear because, like, uh, it seems like I may have missed the point completely, which is... Uh, uh, Thing I I need to check the answers because yeah so uh, this one six question uh, so if you can just have a look at this uh, yes so okay so what are we saying here so we are saying that there is um, in every instance of the stable matching problem there is a stable matching containing M W such that M and W are each other's favorites um, okay so. Let us see. So in spirit, I felt that it's the same as the fifth question somehow, like, and that's why I marked true, but uh, somehow yeah. it was... Right. Okay. Yeah. So then that's a good point. I do remember that when we were framing these questions, they wanted there to be a subtle difference between the previous setting and the, this one and and this one. So uh, let me see. So okay. Now this is okay. <laughs> so I guess clearly I was also thrown off for a few seconds. So maybe this this phrasing can can be confusing. So what are we saying? We are saying that suppose I give you an instance of a stable marriage problem, then. I mean, we are not guaranteeing. So in the previous question, in the fifth question, we are saying we are promising you that in the input, there is a man M that places W on his um, on his first position. And W, that woman, places M on the top of her preference list. So this is a guarantee in the input from our side. So we are saying that, okay, if the input has such a pair, then they have to get matched in every stable matching. And as you have correctly concluded, that is indeed the case. 
here we are promising you nothing about the input. What we are saying is that um, I am giving you some stable matching guy input. And what we are saying is that there must be some stable matching which matches some pair MW who are each other's favorites. But notice that the input itself may not have such a pair, right? So there is no way of guaranteeing this for any instance of stable matching. So here, nothing is promised about the input. We are just saying you have some stable matching instance with, let's say, men are ABC, women are PQR, or whatever. And no matter how ABC and PQR's preferences are, if you look at the space of all stable matchings, there will be at least one where one pair is like each other's favorites. But one of the reasons that may not be the case is because there may not even exist such a pair who like, so for instance, maybe, you know, uh, all the men have a particular woman on the top and all the women have a different like, um, uh, okay, so maybe that's not the best example, but uh, okay, so trust me when I say this, it's really easy to come up with examples where there is, all you have to avoid is M and W being each other's favorites, right? So let's say, you know, A has P as a favorite, you just ensure that P does not have A as a favorite, they have some other, they have some other man ranked on the top. If, as, yeah. It's just like a part of the uh, environment itself, right? Like, if it doesn't exist, then obviously there will not be any pair and we will not hold the uh, algorithm accountable for that, right? So, right. so here what we are saying is more than the algorithm, this is about the structure of the problem itself. So if you read, um, if you read what the problem is trying to stipulate, it's saying that in every instance of the stable matching problem, which means you look at the space of all instances of stable matching. And for every instance, you look at the space of all these stable marriages. And we are claiming that for every instance, you can find a stable marriage that has this additional property. And that is okay. not necessarily yeah. true. OK, uh, OK. I mean, it's still a bit confusing because it's such that is like, even if I look into it like sets, so when we put such that, it's such that is like a condition, right? So right. it's a condition, right, right. In this case, it's a condition on the on the nature of the stable matching that we are trying to guarantee. So all this is to say is that your instance may not have this, it may not have the structure. It's, it's basically to highlight that. It's to highlight okay, and okay. say that your instance may uh so so certainly if the instance has the structure then they will get matched in in fact every stable matching right but yes, yes. the the instance may not like i said you can construct a lot of instances where you don't have this property that you know you don't have this mutual favorite property at all and if you don't okay. have it then all baits are off that's all that we're saying i agree that the wording could probably be a bit clearer but i just want to clarify that that's the difference from the previous question uh, okay, ma'am. And uh, just like for the first question, uh, it just felt that it was too easy. Like I, I just like because uh, these numbers are too large. So whatever is exhausted, it just gets carried forward, and it's like yeah. the minimum. So is that the logic, or there is something? So obvious that I'm missing because no, I think you just do the natural thing, which is just greedily stocking up and giving away uh, as many gifts as you can every day. It basically does not make sense to hoard gifts that you can give away. So you should be giving away whatever you can and uh, keeping track of whatever you cannot. So I wasn't sure if this is like uh, trivial to do like by hand. So I was hoping that maybe this will be an excuse to like, you know, maybe encourage people to write like three lines of python code or something but i think that that was the reason but yeah you can also probably track it by hand as well um but yeah this this was i think intentionally a fairly simple problem yeah okay i mean just uh, one general query which is that i think in one of the questions yeah so there's this uh, statement on c++ multiset i mean is there a requirement to know this uh, no, C++? no there, no there, there really isn't i think this is for you know anyone um who wants to um i think if you're tuned to thinking about the running time in terms of um, an implementation right so i think we should really replace this with a more general point about the, the reason we want to say that it's a C++ multi set is because um, uh, 
because the access, the amount of time that it takes to access the heights, we want to we want to ensure that that's uh, that's something that is not ambiguous. But I think I'll have to dig a little bit deeper into the context of this, and we should probably remove references to a specific programming language. So you're right about that. I think in general, it's uh, so. This is what I think we were talking earlier about data structures. Basically, I want you to not have to worry about you know how much time this is. If there's an operation which says, okay, now we are going to find the knight that has the minimum height, you might wonder about well, okay, how much time does it take to unpack that statement? I mean, to implement that statement. Um, that can that can be an implementation dependent thing. You could have you know a data structure that finds the minimum height in linear time, something that finds it in log n time. So this is just a way to say that that's that that aspect of it is sorted for you. You don't have to worry about it because otherwise the running time is going to be basically it depends. So for you to be able to identify it, so I think we should just remember to make the data structures explicit without references to any specific programming language. So we'll keep that in mind going forward. Uh, yeah, okay, so okay, the multiset reference was only there to like infer uh, that the operation takes off one time, right? Yeah, and in this sense. case, yeah, I think in this case, multiset was a reminder that it's ordered one lookup, but I don't, to be honest, I don't exactly remember the complete context, so I didn't, um, um, I didn't want to fully commit to that, but yeah, I think that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's basically all that there is to it, that, that you can look up the if you want to search for a specific height, I think you know multi-set employs some kind of hashing that lets you assume that you can do it in constant time. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, and for this course, like, uh, what will be the uh, like evaluation structure? As in, like, the quizzes will be subjective, or like the objective things that we are seeing in the graded assignment. So I think for uh, efficiency of grading, we will continue to stick to the objective format. Although I think for actual understanding, I definitely recommend uh, that at least uh, maybe after the quizzes are done, um, you have a chance to actually reflect on why uh, the answers were the way that you claimed them to be. But yeah, I'm just um, in the interest of time, I think we will we will be keeping most of it uh, short answer numeric or, or multiple select or multiple choice. So they will be in a very similar format to what you're seeing in the weekly assignments. Yeah, yeah and in terms of the weightage and everything, I think that's probably announced as a part of the course portal. But if not, I yes, think... Yeah, okay. It's a, yeah, yeah. You have that information already. Okay, that's wonderful. Okay, so I think this sounds good. Um, we're probably um, uh, we're probably getting closer to um, uh, our, our time to our official time to wrap up. But um, but Arya, did you have anything else that you wanted to go through? Um, I don't have anything else, ma'am. So not at the moment. Okay, yeah, no, for sure. I mean, please, uh, please do bring in, um, you know, everything that you want to get clarified to these sessions, and also in in the interim, also to the WhatsApp group or wherever we decide to keep in touch. Oh. Uh, it's really helpful for us as well. Ma'am, is it okay if uh, so? These uh, these uh, notes that you've kept, there's also a comment section, right? So is it okay if I uh, put a small comment or a query uh, inside this? So oh, yeah. Is it like I mean, a good yeah. way to no, no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So the YouTube comments are a bit tricky because I think the YouTube videos are on the IITM channel and I don't get notifications for any comments that come in there. So uh, I often look at comments sometimes months after they've been made. But on the website, in the course notes, uh, those notifications I receive directly. So I should be able to address any comments that you put in over there for sure. So feel free to use the comment section, um, you know, as um, you know, if that's convenient, then that's something that I will be monitoring. So please feel free to use that. Okay, ma'am. Cool. All right, then. So I guess, um, uh, unless there's anything else, I guess we can we can call it a day about here. And um, that's that's a wrap for now, folks. Thanks so much uh, for joining and um, for, for being here all the way till the end. And I think we will find other ways to keep in touch until we meet next time, next week. Yes? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, folks. Bye-bye. Good night. This time, take care. You too.
Okay, so maybe we can stop the recording.